I invite you at this time to turn on your pew Bibles to page 56, where we return now to our sermon series in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 35, pew Bible page 56. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible, and sufficient word. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is, Bethel, and in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, Because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. So it was named Alam Bakuth. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal, Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. Jacob had twelve sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant, Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him at Padan Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years, then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word, may he bless us to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may you enlighten us by this, the word, that in it we might see uh, the glory of Jesus Christ, and we might know the faithfulness you have shown to your people, and by that be encouraged to know that you are faithful to us, your people, as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's uh, many sayings about contentment in the later years of your life. In fact, the one uh, person who wrote that song that we just sang, God of Grace and God of Glory, Harry Emerson Fosdick, he said this, It is magnificent to grow old if one keeps young. James Garfield wrote, If wrinkles must be written upon our brows, let them not be written upon our heart. 
And Samuel Ullman said, you are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fear, as young as your hope, as old as your despair. All these sayings are meant to communicate that growing old does not have to steal our joy or mean that our life needs to be limited or without happiness. Yet the truth is, if God does not exist to bless our later years with a deeper faith, a greater appreciation for his blessings, and a wonderful hope for the life to come, that growing old is just a cruel cosmic joke. But God does exist, and he is faithful to give his children these things. In fact, what we find here in this chapter, Genesis chapter 35, is that Jacob is coming into those last years of his life, the rest of his life. And we learn what that has meant to him, that God has been with him throughout this journey, how that's challenged him, how that's caused him to grow, how that's led him through these series of experiences and what these experiences have taught him and what they can teach us. And they teach us that God is faithful to his children throughout their whole lives. God is faithful to his children throughout their whole lives. So whether we're at the beginning of our life, little ones, or whether we're Towards the end of our life, we can have this great and wonderful promise that God will be faithful to us through it all. And we see this in a couple of ways in Jacob's life. We see this in the way in which God is faithful to Jacob by revealing himself to Jacob and transforming and changing his heart. Another way that we can say this is when God saves you, he continues that work in you. He does not give up on that work. And we see this in the first part of our passage this morning, verses 1 through 15. We see four evidences of a changed heart. Four evidences of a changed heart. But we also see this in Jacob's life through the way that he experiences the unavoidable realities of life. And how these unavoidable realities of life shape him. And how he understands the present nature of God in the midst of all these unavoidable realities. So in the second part of our um, uh, passage this morning, verse 16 through 29, we see four unavoidable realities of life. So let's look at that first part. Four evidences of a changed heart. Verse 1 through 15. Following that incident, that tragic incident in Genesis 34... Um, where uh, Samuel uh, or Simeon and Levi destroy or kill the Shechemites, um, and and that whole scenario, the shameful scenario that happened in that, um, God comes to Jacob and he reminds Jacob of the promise that Jacob made. Jacob said when he was leaving the Promised Land and he slept on a rock and he was afraid that Esau was going to come and kill him. Right, he he uh, had a dream about a ladder. And a place that he called Bethel. And in this, in this dream he saw angels coming up and down from the place of God. And God spoke to him. And God promised that he would be with him. And Jacob said, if you keep your promise, I will come back to this place. And I will give you a tenth of everything that I own. And I will vow to be, that you'll be my God. Right? But Jacob has now entered into the promised land. And he has not yet come to that place again to fulfill his promise. To keep his vows. So God comes to Jacob and he says... Go up to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. And this is what happens after God speaks to him again and tells Jacob to do this. Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Uh, so the first thing that we see in evidence of a changed heart is a desire for holiness. You see, Jacob here in this moment is realizing that he's about to go into the presence of God. He's about to go to the place where God revealed himself to him, the place that he called the house of God. And Jacob realizes something. He realizes that he is an unholy person, that his people, the people that are with him, his family, they are unholy people. They are not pure. 
And we see even in this moment that there is this continued struggle with idolatry and going after these false gods. Remember in the previous uh, chapters that Rachel hid this false gods, these household gods from her dad as he was, they were running away from, from her house, her dad's house. She stole these household gods and brought them with, with her. And Jacob, he's not unaware of this reality. He's not unaware that his time in Padana Ram has caused this, this sense of, of, of syncretism, these false gods with this true God, Yahweh, who's revealed himself to him. And so Jacob tells his family, gather the false gods that you have. And the rings in their ears, in your ears. And bury them under the oak at Shechem. So Jacob has a desire for holiness. This is an evidence of a changed heart. He desires to be set apart. He desires to be pure. He desires, and he knows that God is a holy God, and God calls to us and says, you must be holy like I am holy. This is a reality about who God is. This is the reason, part of the reason why we read the law of God on Sunday morning. And, and what we don't realize, what we often don't think about, is that when we pause for a moment and pray, and in that prayer we enter into the presence of the Holy God, that the only reason we can do that is because our unholiness, our sin, our idolatry, our foreign gods and rings have been smelted and burnt away and purified and washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And even though that reality is true, an evidence of a changed heart, an evidence that God has been at work in our lives, is that we desire holiness in the midst of our own holiness. We desire to grow, to be more pure, to be more set apart, to be become more like Jesus, our Savior. So an evidence of a changed heart is a desire for holiness. In verse 5, though, we read that they set out, and the terror of God fell upon all the towns around them so that no one pursued them. Remember, at the end of Genesis chapter 34, Jacob was worried that what Simeon and Levi had done would put a bad smell in the nostrils of all the Canaanites around them. That he was worried that what Jacob's sons had done, Simeon and Levi had done, by killing the Shechemites and, and, and plundering that city, what that would cause the Canaanites to do is to want to attack the Israelites, want to attack Jacob and his family and put them in a vulnerable situation. But God here, he shows his faithfulness because when he sets out, the terror of God fell upon all the towns around them and no one pursued them. And Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel in the land of Canaan. And there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. So here is the second evidence of a changed heart, and that is the pursuit of obedience. The pursuit of obedience. The reason why you build an altar is because you're going to give a sacrifice. And remember, when Jacob first encountered God in this place, Bethel, he made a vow to God. He made a promise to God about what he would do. He would return back to that place, and he would see in that place uh, he, would, he would make this vow. He would do this thing. And this is what he said in chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28. If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So Jacob made that vow. And even though it has taken him 20 years to come back to this place finally, even though it took God's very own prompting and reminding, Jacob comes here to Bethel. 
He builds an altar so that he can offer a sacrifice. He can give the tenth that he promised to God. So an evidence of a changed heart is a pursuit of obedience. It's not only a desire for holiness, but it's a pursuit of actually living out that holiness. It's a pursuit of living out the life that God has called you to, a life worthy of the calling you have received, the pursuit of obedience. It's a growing in obedience. Now, Jacob is not perfect. But he goes to Bethel. And he sacrifices. He gives obedience by doing this. He comes back to the place, El Bethel. And his growing understanding of who God is is seen here as well. Before, he said, this is the house of God, Bethel. But now he says, no, this is God of the house of God. Meaning, he, in some sense, he realizes that God is not limited spatially. This isn't the place where God lives but this is the place that God has revealed himself to him. And another evidence of a changed heart is a willingness to sacrifice. That's what you do on the altar. You sacrifice. You give a sacrifice. Jacob pursued obedience by finally coming back to Bethel and by finally saying, I'm going to make right by the promises and vows that I made. I'm going to come fulfill those things that I said I was going to do, but I'm also going to sacrifice. And evidence of a changed heart is a willingness in the Christian life to pick up the cross of Jesus Christ and to follow after him, to die to yourself daily so that you might live for Christ and for others. It's to put your own needs, it's to put your own uh, priorities on the back burner so that you can love God and love people. It's a willingness to sacrifice on the altar of our uh, lives, to be living sacrifices, as the New Testament puts that. And we find also that Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. And this is a very meaningful moment for Jacob because Deborah was like a grandma to him. This was Rebecca's nurse that left, um, the prom that left Padan Aram to come and to be uh, with Rebecca, who is Jacob's mother. And uh, Deborah, who uh, was a, a nurse, meant that to Rebecca. Deborah was like a mom, so to Jacob, Deborah was like a grandma. And so to see her die is, is, is difficult, and that's why he names the place Alam Bakuth, which means, um, in the Hebrew, oak of weeping, oak of sorrow. And after Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation, a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I give to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I'll give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with Jacob. And Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him, Bethel. If you're reading this and you're thinking to yourself, this sounds like... Um, the Cliff Notes version of Jacob's story. And if you're like, if you're a student like me, you loved Cliff Notes because, well, you waited too long to try to read that whole book, so you're going to read the synopsis on Wikipedia. That's what this is for Jacob's life. This is his synopsis. If you're like me and you're reading a series of books that have gone on for, for many years, and uh, the last book was published two years ago, and you have no idea what happened before, you really enjoy it when the author puts a synopsis at the beginning of the new book so that you can get caught up to, to date on everything you need to know in order to, to read this, this next book in the series. If you're like me, you actually uh, appreciate when a show has that little recap thing at the beginning of the show, right? And you don't skip that intro because you want to be reminded of everything that came before so that you would have the context for the episode you're watching right then. This is what Jacob, that is for Jacob's life. 
after Jacob returned from Padan Aram. Yeah, he, that, that happened a few chapters ago. Thanks, Moses. God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you'll no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. That happened when God wrestled Jacob in the night a few chapters ago, right? What's going on here? God is coming to him and he is reminding him of all these things, all these realities. And he's giving him a new sense of this. Before, when God changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, it was because Jacob's identity, his purpose, who he was, had been transformed, had been changed. But now God is putting the emphasis on, you will be Israel because you will be a nation. You'll be a people, a nation, right? And so God says to Jacob, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I am the one who is going to accomplish this. I am the one who can be faithful to you from the beginning of your life to the end of your life. And he says, be fruitful and increase in number. Does God not know that Jacob has already had 12 sons? Jacob's at the end of his life. Is he telling Jacob he needs to start over and have 12 more sons? What's he saying here? No, he's saying, because you have been fruitful and in increased in number, because I have been faithful to give you many children, a nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will come from your body. And we know, of course, that the most important king that comes from Jacob's body is the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ. It's not Solomon. It's not David. It's not Saul. It's Jesus and then God says, the promise I made to Abraham and the promise I made to Isaac, I, I make to you. This will be your land to you and to your descendants after you. And what does Jacob do? He, he, doesn't put, he already built the altar, right, where he made the sacrifice. What does he do? He builds a stone pillar. An altar is for sacrifice. A stone pillar is for remembering. The place where God had talked with him and he poured out a drink offering on it. One of the evidences of a changed heart is we remember the promises of God. We remember all the ways that God has been faithful to us and to our spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. All the way down through the generations and we, we wrap all that knowledge up. And then we build something so that our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children can remember that. That's why this is a stone pillar because Jacob is saying, I want everybody to know that God has been faithful to me. I want my children to know that God has been faithful to me. And I want my children's children to know that God has been faithful to me. An evidence of a changed heart is that we remember the promises of God, the promises that God has made. If you want to grow in holiness, if you want to grow in your pursuit of obedience, if you want to grow in your willingness to sacrifice, all of that is dependent upon and hinges upon your believing the promises of God, which all find their yes and their amen in Jesus Christ. So those are four evidences of a changed heart. But what about the four unavoidable realities of life? Verses 16 through 29, we see that Jacob goes through a lot. He's already had to bury a person that he viewed as a grandma, his grandmother. But as they leave Bethel and they come to a place, Ephrath, close to Bethlehem, Rachel begins to give birth and she has great difficulty. And this is, Rachel, this is the wife that Jacob truly loves, the one he wanted, the one he wasn't tricked into marrying, the one he was tricked into working seven more years to have, but all seemed like a blink of an eye because he loved her so much. And she was having great difficulty in childbirth, and the midwife said to her, don't be afraid, you have another son. And they didn't have all the, the great technology that we have today, the medical tools that we have today, and the expertise that we have today. Childbirth was such a risky thing, and it still is today in many ways. She breathed her last. 
And as she was dying, she named her son Benoni, son of my trouble, son of my sorrow, son of my hardship. But his father thought that would not be a good name for him. So he named him Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my strength. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. And over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar. And to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. To, the, to this day, the day in which this was written. And it could still be there today. And Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. And while Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. And Israel heard of it. Such a strange passing remark to state here. But this is actually something that will shape the future of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, Reuben will lose his privilege as the oldest. And his uh, double inheritance will be given to Joseph's sons. That's why we don't hear of the tribe of Joseph. We hear of the tribe of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The inheritance that they received was actually the double inheritance Reuben was meant to receive, but because of Reuben's betrayal here. It's something that he loses. In fact, this might seem like a very strange thing for us to read, but many commentators will tell you that in the ancient Near East, one of the ways that you showed that you were taking the place of prominence, that you were conquering is that you would sleep with the king's concubines. And if you know the story of David's son, Absalom, who took over the kingdom in a time of frustration and division, Absalom took all David's concubines out onto the roof of the palace, and he slept with them in the presence of everyone to show that he was now king. And as horrible and Backwards and disgusting that practice is, many will tell you that Reuben in this moment sees in a, in a moment of weakness in Jacob's life that his dearly loved wife, Rachel, is dead, that he is probably mourning. Here's my opportunity to take my place at the head of the household, to be the front man. Just like Absalom was an opportunist, Reuben here is trying to take leadership in an unhealthy, divisive, and backwards way. And here we read then, finally, Jacob's 12 sons listed the sons of Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant, Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. And then here at the end, we read of the death of Isaac and how this funeral, once again, just like Abraham's funeral brought Isaac and Ishmael together, um, Isaac's funeral brings Esau and Jacob together to bury him. Now that I've summarized that, I'd, I'd like to tell you about the four unavoidable realities of life that we all experience. And, and it's all neatly packaged here for us in the later years of Jacob's life. That even as he has shown evidences of a changed heart, even as he has shown us in the previous section of this very chapter a desire to grow in holiness, a pursuit of obedience in the life of faith, a willingness to sacrifice and a remembering of the promises of God and the faithfulness of God, Jacob still cannot avoid the joys of life. We all experience the joys of life. Look at them wrapped up in this chapter, the joys of new life. You have a new son. The joys of the blessings of God. Jacob, you have 12 sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. You have been so tremendously blessed. Right? But in the same time that Jacob is experiencing the joys of life, the ups of life, 
The, the mountaintop experiences of life, many of us can think of these moments. We don't have to think that hard to think of these great moments in our life. Our wedding day, the day that our first child was born, the day our second child was born, third child, fourth child, fifth child, sixth, sixth child, and some of us can't go that far, and some of us are going further. We can also think of the sorrows of life. So here is Jacob is experiencing the wonder and the beauty of a new person coming into this world. One he wants to call the son of my right hand, the son of my strength. It's also the son whose entrance into this life marks the death of his dear wife, Rachel. The one she wanted to call, son of my trouble. The joys and the sorrows of life intermingled, right? The joys and sorrows of life intermingled. Here, Jacob is is, is reminded of the blessing God has given to him of all these 12 sons. And the next moment that we have recorded in Scripture for us, Jacob is burying his father, Isaac. The joys and the sorrows of life intermingled. We can't avoid the joys, and we can't avoid the sorrows. We're going to experience them them all. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, when we are experiencing the joys, are we giving glory to God? We say, God, these gifts come from you. God, I give thanks to you and the joys and the mountaintop experiences and the wonders of life that we get to experience. But also, are we doing the same in the sorrows? God... I know you're with me in the midst of these sorrows. I know you're with me in the midst of these hardships. I know you're with me in the midst of the the loss of a loved one, the loss of a dear wife, a dear husband. I know you're with me in the midst of this season of loneliness and hardship and difficulty. And here's another thing. Do we know that God is with, with us in the midst of wounds? The wounds. Not only are we going to experience joys, not only are we going to experience sorrows, but we're going to be hurt in this life. You can't escape it. Jacob just lost his dearest wife, Rachel, and the next thing that we're told is that his son went in and slept with his concubine. Now this is not... um, an opportunity here where I'm explaining the morality or the um, appropriateness of Jacob having a concubine or not, Um, Jacob having multiple wives or not. All I know is that in this moment, Jacob is hurt. And his son Reuben kicks him while he's down. He dishonors him. In fact, in the Bible, you will hear in the law of God that it is wicked for a son to uncover his father's nakedness. And that might make you think of something, right? It might make you think of the encounter between Noah and his son. And the reason why in the the law of God, it says it is a wicked thing To uncover your father's nakedness is not because you're actually going in to see your father naked, but because you are sleeping with his wife or his concubine. And the reason why is because those two have become one flesh. So to uncover the nakedness of your uh, father's wife is to uncover his nakedness. And it's a shameful thing. It's an incestuous thing. It's a thing that would be condemned to the highest degree of the law. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And Reuben here is doing it. A shameful, wicked thing. That later on in Jacob's life, when he comes to Egypt, and he gives blessings and curses to all of his children, at the end of his 130 years of life, Jacob will remember. He doesn't just hear about it in this moment. He remembers it. And he says, Reuben, you hurt me. By doing this, I did not forget it. So we're going to experience wounds in life. And here's the truth. 
those wounds that we have experienced. Uh, for Christians, are meant to be things that we forgive. Forgive one another just as in Christ, God has forgiven you. And there's a difference between forgiving and forgetting. The truth is, we can forgive, but if we have received a wound, there's going to be a scar there still. There's going to be something that reminds us of that. That the winds of time bring us a moment in which reminds us of that hurt that we received or that hardship or that wound that we received. It's a moment which brings us to our knees. It's a moment that, that we, we, come to, we come alive again with the grief and the hurt that that was. It doesn't mean that we haven't forgiven. It just means that life impacts us. Our bodies remember these things. And here's the reality too. When we experience wounds in this life, and when life brings us reminders of these wounds, it also reminds us that we have wounded others. That we're not just the wounded, we're the wounders. Or as has often been said, hurt people hurt people. We cannot avoid the reality of wounds in this life. Jacob did not. But we can look to the one who was wounded on our behalf, whose stripes took away our stripes, whose wounds brought us healing. And even as we experience wounds in this life and even as we are reminded of the wounds we may have personally caused that we can't take back, we can't make better. We have a Savior who has been wounded in our place. It's him that we should look to as we let God heal and continue to heal the wounds of this life, knowing that even if the evidence of those wounds never fully goes away in the life to come. Those things which hurt us in this life and the people which hurt us in this life and those things which we have hurt others with and the others that we have hurt, they will only serve in the life to come as evidences of the glorious grace of God. And how good he is. And here's the last unavoidable reality of life that Jacob faces. He faces that we all must come to the end of our own lives. Not only has he seen the death of Deborah in this chapter, someone he saw as a grandma, the death of his dear, dearly beloved wife, Rachel, but he buries his father, Isaac. We have to come to the reality that we are not going to live forever. We have to come to the reality that we need to face, which is there is for everybody one death, and that there is a God who is waiting on the judgment seat. In some of my reading recently, I've been reading The Glory of Christ by John Owen. And he lists on that, in that reading an objection that all, often people have about coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And that objection, he says, is this. Yes, I admit I must come to Christ by faith, or I am lost, but I cannot come now. There are many things I must do first. I do not have the time to spend trying to come to Christ. So I will wait until I have more time. That's somebody who is not facing the unavoidable reality of death. And this is how John Owen answers that objection. This is incontrovertible proof of the foolishness and deceitfulness of unbelief. Can anything be more foolish than to put off considering the eternal destiny of your soul? To prefer present trifles which will only lead to eternal misery 
to eternal blessedness is the height of folly. You come to hear the word, and when you go away, the language of your heart is a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10. Do you say, we will remain as we are for a little while longer, and then we will stir ourselves up to take hold of Christ for salvation? Under this deceit, multitudes perish every day. This is a dark and evil disguise under which unbelief hides. This is why the Bible has continued uh, testimony over and over and over again is that today is the day of salvation. Do not wait. Do not linger. We must all come to face the reality of the brevity of life. That death could be for us 10 years from now and it could be tonight. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we trust in a God who is faithful to us all the way through our lives, even till the very end? Do we believe in a God that is faithful to carry us from this life into his presence? Do we believe in a God of which we confess our only comfort in life and in death? Is that we are not our own, but belong in body and soul, in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. These are things we have to ask ourselves. Because we need to know that God does exist and that he is faithful to give his children a good life, even into the later years of your life. We can trust that God is faithful to us, his people, and he can be faithful to us throughout our whole lives from beginning to end. And God has expressed this faithfulness to us most supremely, most perfectly in life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Trust in that God. Lean on his faithfulness. Lean on his faithfulness in order to grow in your desire for holiness. Lean on his faithfulness in pursuit of continued obedience. Lean on his faithfulness as you grow in your willingness to sacrifice your life, to live for him. Lean on his, his faithfulness as you remember his promises and how he's been faithful in his promises to his people in the past. He can be faithful to you in the present and he will be faithful to you in the future. Lean on his faithfulness in the joys and the sorrows and the wounds and even to the very end of your life. Amen. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We pray, Lord, that our faith in your faithfulness will grow up till we take our very last breath and you carry us to be in your presence or until Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? Celebration Hymnal 665. O Master, let me walk with thee.